personality. Huge smile. It's a child's worst nightmare to lose a mom. Every day I wanted answers. Every day I was told it was unknown. People don't just die. She was a loving mother. He was a crime-fighting prosecutor. You are a pillar of that community. I did what I thought was right. Then one day, the law was at his door. His wife was dead in bed. Her eyes were open. She was pale. I just remember crying. Suspicious, but no evidence of a crime. Any signs of a struggle? No. It was case closed. Years pass. New lives. Two new wives. He's extremely charming. We just had the most amazing time. Then, a new detective. What jumped out at you? Most definitely that her arms were in a, in a naturally raised position. My first thought was we missed something. The manner of death would be homicide. What really happened in that bedroom? I wanted to answer all their questions. We didn't remember a whole lot about that day. A young mother's death was a mystery. What happened to her? To my face? Don't give me excuses. I'm Lester Holt, and this is Dateline. Here's Dennis Murphy with Mystery on the Mississippi. A long, meandering life, feeding industry, towns, and imaginations. The Mississippi River gave us Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain, grew up in Hannibal, Missouri. And just across the river in Quincy, Illinois, lived another one. Curtis Lovelace, a small-town kid who wanted to be a star. And for a time, he was a football champion for the University of Illinois. He's an All-American? Mm-hmm. All-American. This is what kids dream about. Right. He was living that life. Absolutely. You know, he it was looking like he would get a dream of his. Then he realized grander ambitions, fighting crime as a prosecutor, serving his country in the National Guard, and his community in politics. I'm someone who wants meaningful work that's going to make the difference in, in, in the lives of people. But Quincy, to one person in particular, that made Curtis really stand out for all the world to see. Well, now to continuing coverage in the Curtis Lovelace murder case. It was a heated day at the stand. Right now, the defense is presenting its closing arguments in the case. Big dreams on a mighty river can, can drag you under. This is the very strange journey of Curtis Lovelace, All-American to Criminal Defendant. Let's roll back the years to high school and to the woman who would become the focus of so much speculation. Went to high school together, we, we really didn't run in the same crowd. Uh, we had some mutual friends and we didn't date in high school. Back then, Curtis was more focused on football than dating. It wasn't until he went off to the University of Illinois, roughly 200 miles away, and became a star girl from back home for the first time. It was during a college break. The former classmates bumped into each other in Quincy and quickly became an item. Corey wasted no time spreading her good news. I'll never forget the day. I was playing tennis with a friend of mine, and Corey came over and you know, met us, and was, Kurt was it. Beth Dobrzynski went to high school with a new couple. Surprised? Not really. No, they seemed a, a great fit together, and she was, she was very, very much smitten. It wasn't long before Corey was also telling her mother, Marty, she'd found... She comes home, and we're sitting there, and she said, I met the man I'm going to marry. Uh, whoa. <laughs> Back up. And she kept her promise. In 1991, just after college, Corey and Curtis married. He studied law. She worked a small job. To situation, they decided to buy a home in Quincy. They wanted to be in the neighborhood, and they wanted to be close by, and it just made it all the better. So we found them a house, and they moved back. Virtually over the fence, huh? Over the Two back line. Two houses up and one over. Yeah. <laughs> Curtis's ambitions drove to get her in the Adams County State Attorney's Office and dabbled in school board politics, winning a seat and serving as president. He even found time to teach a business law class at Quincy University. In between the professional milestones, the Lovelaces started a family. First, because Corey juggled that part of their lives. How was your Corey as a mother? She's a young mom. Fantastic. She was a great mom. There wasn't anything she didn't do for those kids. 
Corey's days were filled with diapers, play dates, and tantrums. But even then, this great mom never forgot how to be a 2006. Her dad, John, was dying of cancer. That was a major event for all of you. That was a major event. John's yes. decline. Huh? Well, in four years he fought it. And the last six months of his life, she came every night at five o'clock and sat for him like him. Worn down with the stress of caregiving, raising four kids, was it any wonder when Corey herself fell ill? It was the weekend before Valentine's Day, 2006. She was feeling poorly and, and spent feeling most... poorly. How What was she ailing from? Uh, 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 throwing up. Um, we, we we thought she had the had the flu. But on Monday, the night before Valentine's Day, Corey still managed to get the kids' Valentine's cards ready for school the next day. Her daughter Lindsay, then 12, remembers cuddling up with her mom, watching the Winter Olympics. I remember watching him with her and being like, Mom, he's so cute. Like, <laughs> as a 12-year-old, like, that was awesome. But it wasn't as that she, she was bedridden or anything at that point. She, she could, no, she would... She was just feeling crummy, huh? She was feeling sick. And even for my mom, that was not common. Because she, if, even if she was sick, that was expected of her and took care of us and made us dinner and did laundry and everything because that was her role. But when Tuesday, Valentine's Day, dawned, Curtis says he urged her to take it easy. And we decided that uh, I would cancel my morning class at Quincy University in, in order to, to and so that's so Dad is going to be on deck. It's going to be Dad's time to get everybody up and running here. Right. Uh, and so, uh, so I canceled my class um, uh, to help the kids get ready for school. She did come downstairs to uh, uh, help out with that. Had to help her back to bed before driving the three eldest kids off to school. Backpack stuffed with Valentine's cards. Within minutes, he was back. Only the home, still cluttered with clothes and toys, was now filled with something else. Silence. Quiet enough to break up. What had happened in that house when we returned? As I got closer, I immediately knew that something was, was really, really wrong. So wrong, it would tear apart a family and puzzle police for years to come. Every detective needs to keep in mind that... The routine of the house was in a tizzy. With Corey sick in bed, it had his kids off to school. Now he was back. When I arrived home, um, everything was quiet. I assumed that Corey was sleeping, resting. She hadn't slept uh, most of the night. I was just going to leave her alone in order to um, sleep. Before looking in on the kitchen, then he headed upstairs. I needed to take a shower, and as I walked up the steps, I, I looked to the left. Um, the door to our bedroom as I left it open, I could see her lying in bed, and I could see uh, something right. Um, so I, I approached what, what her. What made you say that, looking back? Uh, just, uh, I'm, I'm really not sure. As I got closer, I could see that uh, she was pale, she was motionless, and uh, I, I immediately knew that something was, was really, really wrong. Did you think she... I shook her. I called out her, her name, um, and at that point, I, I knew that she was dead. In that moment, he said, his thoughts turned to his four-year-old boy, Larson, who was still in needed to get Larson out of the house. And what did you do? Uh, I grabbed Larson. Uh, I believe he was in bed, and uh, I took him immediately over to, uh, to his grandparents' house. Corey's mom, Marty, answered the door. She remembers her son-in-law standing there nonsensical about her daughter being dead. It was just kind of mid-morning. And, and there he is, your son and, and there he is. And I opened the door and he hands me Larson. And then he said something about people are coming or something. And I, I often regretted not just putting Larson down and running over there. Stunned, Mother Peter had his dental practice. I got a phone call from my mom when just kind of out of the blue. I didn't think anything. Corey's dead. That can't be. Yeah, 30 exactly. Years old, she's, right? she's 38 years old. There's no way. I just, just saw her a couple weeks ago. Jeff Baird, then a detective with the Quincy Police Department, was assigned to head the death investigation. He went straight upstairs. 
He was in the bedroom when the coroner examined Corey's body. He tested her body temperature by placing his hand against her abdomen. I followed suit. Was the body warm or cold? The, the abdomen was warm to the touch. Warm. What did that tell the coroner? He knew that the time of death then for the body to still be warm. It seemed clear that Corey's death had been recent, within the past hour or so. Not at all certain why or how the woman died. The detective couldn't rule out any possibility, including foul play. Around the room, it says, are any signs of a struggle? No. So as I hear you, you're telling me you're seeing a woman who has apparently died in her bed. And not that long before authorities arrive. That's right. If I can stress, there wasn't a single mark on her other than her nose. Not a mark. And yet there was something about the position of Corey's body that did strike him as odd. He thought death and gravity would have caused her arms to drop. Instead, they were both fixed in midair, hovering above her chest. I was looking for an explanation. Curtis Loveless, I asked him if there was a possibility that blankets had been under her arms when he discovered her. And what did he say? No. He said no. So he said the scene that you were seeing was the way he saw it when he came and found his wife. Yes. By his account. Yes. But then up on one strange detail this early in a case. Every detective needs to keep in mind that there, there could be a bigger picture. And oh yes there was. A portrait of a woman, a portrait of a marriage, filled with details painted in a most unflattering light. Peek behind closed doors. You were drinking too much? I drank too much. Corey was drinking too much? Corey was drinking too much. And a daughter mourns her mom. I just remember crying and not believing it. When Dateline continues. The Quincy, Illinois detective was trying to understand why a 38-year-old woman had died suddenly. As he looked for clues inside Corey Lovelace's home, filled with a clutter of young family life, particular, a white cup by her bedside. I collected an unknown liquid that smelled faintly of alcohol from a styrofoam cup. The detective asked her husband, Curtis, what it was. Did he tell you that she liked to have a vodka tonic? Yes. And that's likely what was in the styrofoam? Yes. As Curtis told it, alcohol had been a constant in the home. There was alcoholism in our family, so there was the, the ugly side of, of that. You were uh, drinking too much? Uh, I... Looking back, yes, I, I drank too much. Corey was drinking too much. Cor Corey was drinking too much. It was impacting her ability um, to take care of things at home. He also told the detective that Corey had been taking falls, sometimes out of bed. What's more, the detective later found out Corey had been battling bulimia. The picture quickly emerging. Corey had not been a healthy words that a subject is telling you, but you're also looking at them. Why is he telling me this? How does he phrase it? What were you seeing on that score? It's very important, and I saw a man who was answering my questions. Not being evasive, not shifty, cooperative, solemn, upset. Curtis, one morning. He last saw his wife around 8.15. He took the kids to school. He returned and found her deceased. With that, the detective finished the interview and left. But Curtis knew his awful day was about to get worse. Not least, he had four, four to twelve to look after. How do you tell the children? That was, um, I, I, I think to this day, that is the most difficult thing I've ever had to do. Um, I, I believe I, I, I called the schools and let them know that I... Lindsay, the only girl, was the eldest of the Lovelace kids. I remember being at school. I remember getting a call from the office that I was getting picked up. And in my mind, I thought, oh, maybe my mom went to the hospital. She didn't feel good the days prior. Maybe she just had to go to the hospital. Like, it's fine. Her father broke the news. And told me that my mom had died. And I just remember then on my world crashing down. Did you say what had happened? What's going on? I'm sure I asked what had happened. I just remember crying and not believing it. And we went to my grandma's house. And I was like, I want to go back to school. And I went back to school. And you did on the day you lost your mom. Because that was normal for me. It was a normalcy thing. And in hindsight, she says, maybe the best thing she could have done. Her 
favorite teacher had something for her. She actually had wolf pups. So I remember holding these wolf pups. I'm pretty sure they had just lost their mom. Like, they were orphaned. What a jumble of things going on for you that day. And that was the most comforting thing I could have done, was hold those wolves. By then, news of Corey Lovelace's untimely death was rippling across town. Students from Curtis's business law class, their family and authorities, to suspect that something had happened. His class was all outside of his classroom, waiting for him to come. One of Curtis's students, Erica, was surprised to learn Professor Lovelace's class had been canceled. Later, she learned why. Everyone was just in shock because she was very, she seemed healthy from what everybody understood. So it was a huge shock. That so that's very sad. Your professor's wife has died. I, you didn't know her. I didn't know her, and I really didn't know him at that time either. Soon, everyone in town was wondering what had caused colleges to perform the autopsy a day later noted some trauma, a small abrasion on Corey's upper lip, and another mark inside. It appeared to be a cut. Curtis mentioned that Corey had fallen in the days before her death. Those falls, as they described it, could account for that injury to the lip, right? Presumably. But yes, a fall could account for an injury. The pathologist also noted Corey had what's called fatty liver, often caused by heavy drinking. Still, the doctor labeled the cause of death undetermined. She doesn't know what killed this woman. That was frustrating. She had a disease of the liver, which can be associated with sudden death. Unusual for a young woman to die of unknown causes, but it does happen. Without more to go on, the detective closed the case. Corey's mother, Marty, still in shock, autopsy report. Corey was drinking. We don't deny that. She was um, bulimic, and, and I did try to talk to Curtis about that at one time. I told him it was all okay and it was going to be fine. Now, as she mourned Corey, Marty knew her suffering would only be dying. We had a visitation for Corey, and John sat next to me, and it was like he was saying goodbye to friends, too. Hmm. He didn't come home from the hospital. So both those losses, one right on top of the other. Yes. Within the span of and a husband, she purchased two burial plots at the local cemetery, even though Corey's remains were cremated. That was a choice Curtis says the entire family made together. But the decision to cremate would be one that would haunt this river town for years to come. Got me different than anyone I had ever dated before. Curtis moves on much too fast for some. She arrived as the girlfriend. Did I think it was too quickly? Yes. For so many years, he'd been the guy in town people looked up to and admired. Curtis Lovelace, football star, school board president, suddenly a pitiable widower who needed help. It was overwhelming. People friends and family, helping get the kids to school in the morning, so I have to go to work, and then picking them up from school. It's a lot. It's a lot, but we came together as, as a family and, and, and did what we needed to do. To longtime friend Beth Dobrzynski, Curtis was stoic in the weeks after court noticed the mask slip just a little. It was at a high school reunion later that summer. They were doing a video montage, and Corey's picture came up. He turned around, he looked, and he goes, hey, that's my wife. And it was just times like that that made, you know, made me really think that leaving husband. That's why a few months later, she and other friends were surprised to hear that Curtis had met someone new. That was fast. She was different um, than, than anyone I had ever dated before. Maybe in some ways the difference um, in trees. Erica. As in the former student who showed up to Professor Lovelace's canceled class that fateful Valentine's Day morning. He's extremely charming. Anything that I needed or wanted, he could take care of, and he did. At the time this interview took place, Erica asked us to alter her... She began her story by recounting how she, as a 33-year-old single woman, had bumped into her 37-year-old professor at a nightclub not long after Corey's death. A fish out of water, she thought. And I felt really bad for him, so I gave him my number and I told him uh, that there's a go in town that there's people more his age 
because I thought he was a lot, lot older than what he was. He just seemed... Just stood out at that club, huh? He did, <laughs> quite a bit. <laughs> but not long after, pity blossomed into friendship and then love. They started dating about six months ago, and her daughter from a previous relationship eventually moved in with Curtis and his four children. It was nice that my child kind of just tucked in there with the rest of them. All of us just fell into place. That's not the way Curtis's daughter, Lindsay, saw it. What'd you think of her, Erica, from the get-go? From the get-go. She arrived as the girlfriend, and that's just how it was. And did I think it was too quickly? Yes. But adults make their own decisions. In fact, Lindsay was so unhappy with her dad's girlfriend, she picked up and moved in with her grandmother, Corey's mom, just a few two years of living together, Curtis and Erica married. She'd admired how he'd coach local kids in sports and devoted spare time to his community. Eventually, they both served together in the National Guard. And he had an outstanding resume. He did. He this is the all-American boy. I loved the fact that he was where my profession was leaning. And I loved that he worked with children. He was great. He seemed to be great with the children. They even bought a new place in town together and moved from the house where Corey had died. There was domestic tranquility at first, a change in her husband. He'd detach once in a while, just from the whole family, and I was kind of left all to myself, and he would just hide in the basement and blame it on work. She says their mutual silence separated them. Then, resentment exploded in loud confrontation. I believe, looking back, that was a, a rebound relationship, um, and, uh, and a relationship that I, I should have not done not only for me, but, but more importantly, for my children. In 2013, after five years of marriage, Curtis filed for divorce, shy about jumping into love again, but not Curtis. It was just surreal and lovely. This is Christine. She'd known Curtis since high school, he even took her to their homecoming dance. Marriages and careers separated them for a time. It was odd because I wasn't, and I wasn't looking for anything and like where that. where were you in your life, Christine? Were you a single? I yet? was. I was single. After reconnecting on Facebook, the former classmates decided to catch up face-to-face -face for the first time in nearly three decades. There he is at the door. There he is at the what door. What do you see? I see Kurt Lovelace and Date standing there. And then we spent that evening with friends, and before we knew it, everyone else had gone, and we just had the most amazing time. I was meeting in many ways the, the, the same person who I took to homecoming, just more beautiful, uh, more in, uh, more kind than, than I had ever remembered. It just worked. More than six months later, on the day after Christmas 2013, Curtis was once again standing at the altar. Only this time, the new Mrs. Lovelace seemed to have approval from everyone, even 20-year-old daughter Lindsay, father's last flame. She seemed very genuine. Um, I like that she cared a lot about the boys. Did you think maybe this could be the restoration of the family? Yeah, I After did. After the nightmare, as you see it, of, of Erica. Now here's Christine, who seems okay to you. But she's certainly making an effort to reach out to you, right? I Yeah, and I felt like our, after everything we had been through, so I was hoping that it would all pan out okay. And it did go okay. Christine kept all the Lovelaces running like a Swiss train schedule. Kids off to school, while Curtis worked at his own law practice in downtown Quincy. Christine, meanwhile, put on her baker well, pie shop. I was making 100 pies a week. And I was selling out of pies before 9 o'clock in the morning. By all so accounts, this wasn't just a little hobby to keep you busy? No. This was a going concern, huh? Yes, absolutely. What's your go-to pie? I love blueberry. I'm but, with you. But I make a mean gooseberry, you name it, I can probably... of turmoil, it seemed the Lovelaces were reborn. Lindsay was back in the family fold. Christine had even adopted Curtis's sons as her own. Everything was working. But darker souls wait for the train wreck just when things are looking all hunky-dory. Turned out that... Coming up, a new detective leads to new suspicion. What jumped out at you? Most definitely that her arms were in a, in a naturally raised position. And the start of a new investigation. My first thought was we missed something here. When Dateline... The river rolled. The barges slid by. 
And Corey Lovelace's death slipped further into the past. I'll go sit in the cemetery by myself for a little while. And of course, Valentine's Day now is nothing. I don't do Valentine's Day. Corey's husband, meanwhile, had remarried, divorced, and married again. And in all that time, no one really questioned the why or how that changed one day when a man in a windowless room a few blocks off the Mississippi found himself with spare time on his hands. I was sitting in my office, and all of our files were on computer. It was late 2013, almost eight years after Corey's death. Active with the Quincy Police Department, began idly pulling up old files. Not looking for anything in particular, just reading old cases. Corey Lovelace popped into my head and I read the report. Did they mean anything to you? Uh, yeah, I knew, I knew Curtis Lovelace because uh, he was had bitterness. There wasn't much to read in the file, truth be told. A statement from Curtis, the husband, police interviews with the three older children, and the pathologist's summary of her autopsy findings with some photos. So you knew what had happened in 2006, sort of, or? Yeah, I knew that she had passed away on. What was the medical examiner's finding about the death of that woman? That was undetermined, was the original autopsy. What did that mean to you? I don't know if you'd encountered that before. Undetermined could mean a lot of things, uh, but in this particular autopsy, there were things listed as suspicious or traumatic findings. Fusion on Corey's face just under her nose, something the arriving officer had observed that day. The pathologist also noted the cut, what she called a laceration on the inside of Corey's upper lip. The detective kept scrolling and then saw something that just stopped him cold and electrifying in a dead wife and mother as she lay in her bed. What jumped out at you? Most definitely that her arms were in a, an unnaturally raised position. The hands in an unnatural kind of way. Her hands defy gravity. Not supported on anything? No. Just kind of out there like a statue? Yes. Using police photos for graphic representation of Corey's bedroom, you can see Corey's arms frozen in death above her body. That final pose had caught Detective Jeff Baird's attention years before. A curiosity, but he didn't assign it any real significance. Now, Adam Gibson did. Rigor mortis? The mechanics of rigor mortis go like this. Upon death, a human's muscles start to stiffen. But to the detective, it looked as though Corey's arms and hands were in an advanced state of rigor, meaning she likely died many hours before this photo was taken. Remember, Kurt only an hour before finding her dead. It didn't make sense to the officer. Detective Gibson went straight to his bosses with the old Lovelace file. My first thought was we missed something here. Chief Robert Copley had been in charge in 2006 when everyone assumed Corey had died a natural death. But he said it was now holding before him. And that's when I saw the pictures the first time. What'd you think? I thought, uh, this, this is odd. This is not natural. This posture of the arms? The posture of the arms. So definitely appeared to me that rigor mortis had set in. I, I look at those pictures and I can't believe that we accept the cause of death and a natural death. Detective Gibson agreed. But they had a problem. Very thin what you're working with. Some, yes. some notes from a medical examiner from eight right. years before right. and, and a, a few photos, very few. Yeah, and only two uh, two slides uh, were, were taken by the evidence. So, yeah, very thin file. So police went back to the doctor who did that autopsy and asked her to review the case. She did, but she would not alter her original findings. The next step might have been to order a new autopsy, but that wasn't possible since Corey's family had her remains cruised to work with what they had. Detective Gibson had a suggestion. He wanted to have the autopsy reviewed by someone else, have a, basically a, a review of the original autopsy done. Couldn't do a, a new autopsy because the body had been cremated. The chief okayed the request to hide old autopsy notes. The detective also had something else in mind to beef up his case, talk to anyone and everyone who'd known Corey. His first call was to her mom, Marty. He told her he wanted to meet, but not why. He said, well, you know, can we set up a time maybe tomorrow or, what, you know, whatever. I said, well, can you just come now? Because I was so nervous about what it was. Everything old was about to be new again. New and very unsettling. Coming up, a different medical examiner reaches a different conclusion. The manner of death would be homicide. The question for Curtis's daughter... Tuesday morning, before you went to school here, remember? What did you think was happening? I didn't.
now. Lori Lovelace's mom had tried hard to move on after her daughter's sudden death in 2006. But after a phone call and a visit from Detective Adam Gibson in early 2014, she started to wonder. A lot of things I shoved away, really shoved away. Really, why Corey had died? Did you ever suspect that there might be foul play involved in her death? Friends of both Curtis and Corey also started getting calls from the detective. Beth Dobrzynski remembers his message asking her to call ASAP. So that we're reopening the case of Corey Didrickson Loveless, I was shocked. I was shaking. So the detective seemed to be interested in what you could tell him about the marriage. Correct. Which she admitted wasn't much. Beth and other close friends said Corey didn't really talk about her marriage. So then on this case, he started knocking on doors talking to Corey's former neighbors. All the neighbors talked about uh, all the, the constant arguing and fighting. So you were getting a picture of what was going on in that marriage that wasn't in focus in 2006. Right. The detective went a step further. He took miles to the University of Iowa to talk with someone who would have been an eyewitness to the Lovelace marriage. I'm Adam Gibson. Nice to meet you. I'm a detective with Quincy. Okay, okay. Lindsay Lovelace, Curtis and Corey's oldest, was in college at her mom's alma mater when she was summoned to the campus police department. Very confused why someone from Quincy had driven there. The questions that followed didn't clear things up, at least not at first. The detective started talking about her late mom and asking about her parents' marriage. How was your parents' relationship to you? They had fights. It was an the perfect family. Um, for the first time, someone inside the Lovelace family was revealing the turmoil before Corey's death. But then the detective asked Lindsay to describe that her mother's body was found. Tuesday morning, before you went to school here, remember? The answer seemed to take the air out of his theory of the case. She was up and walking around. Um, she had made breakfast. Or the young woman, candid about her parents' troubled marriage, was nonetheless supportive of her father's account. Corey had died minutes after seeing her children off to school, not hours earlier as the detective suspected. If he'd been disappointed in Lindsay's answer, he didn't show it. Her off guard. If you do talk to your dad, the that I would ask is that you not discuss the fact that I can't talk to you yet. What did you think was happening? I didn't know, especially when he said, don't tell your father I was here. So what's that mean? I sat there and thought, what is going on? And then it slowly hit me. She realized the detective, for whatever reason, suspected her father had something to do with her mother's sudden death. Even so, she kept her promise and did not tell her father about the visit. In the meantime, Detective Gibson was waiting to hear the medical examiner for the city of St. Louis. He had hired her to review that old autopsy report. The thing that struck me first, just looking at the scene photographs, was the position of Mrs. Lovelace's arms. She says the photos show Corey's body in full rigor mortis, and may believe the picture and Curtis's story were out of sync. I estimate that the time of death was somewhere 10 to 12 hours uh, prior to her photograph being taken that morning. So somewhere around 9 or 10 or 11 p.m. In other words, the night of February 13th, not the morning of February 14th, as Curtis claimed. Something else bothered her. Turner thought the scene appeared altered as though something under Corey's arms was removed. Why were her hands not resting on a surface? And that cert was that her hands had been resting on. Why wasn't there anymore? Turner noted the abrasion on Corey's face and the cut inside her upper lip. To her, that suggested something had been pressed against the woman's mouth. And then seeing the, the marks around the mouth and inside the chest, that suffocation occurred. Suffocation, an abrasion, an accepted timeline that no longer fit. Turner was convinced Corey had not died a natural death. She concluded someone had used an object, likely a pillow, to suffocate the woman, left many hours later.
the manner of death would be homicide. For the detective, Corey Lovelace's death came down to two competing narratives from two compelling women. One relied on science to explain a murder, the other relied on memory to describe an ailing mother just before she passed. The detective believed the science. He believed that a crime had indeed been committed. But now Chief Copley had a little problem back at the Quincy Police Department. There were two officers who had conducted very different investigations of the same case. Detective Gibson, you believe that this was a homicide? I do believe that. Off natural causes. Are you divided on that fundamental issue? I'm now uncertain from what I've heard and been told under the, under the new investigation. See, Much more uncertain than I was in 2006. Their boss, Chief Copley, still backs both men. He says if there's blame... You hate to admit that mistakes were made, and, and I want to say that I, I take full responsibility. I was chief in 2006. You know, yeah, I, I had detectives and their supervisors working on this case, but... Did, chief, did he get a pass because he was a pillar of the community? He was a, he was a big shot guy. I don't know that he got a pass. I think he the benefit of the doubt. Curtis Lovelace was no longer going to get the benefit of the doubt because Detective Gibson's next stop would be the grand jury. Coming up, a day Christine and Curtis Lovelace won't soon forget. Totally blind. So Horrifying. When Dateline continues. Continuing our story. Seven years after the mysterious death of Corey Lovelace. I just remember crying and not believing it. Police have reopened the case. We miss it. Who had remarried twice is the prime suspect. What jumped out at you? Most definitely their arms were in a, in a naturally raised position. Had the mystery finally been solved? The manner of death would be homicide. Now, the suspect and his wife are about to get some very bad news. Cor Corey wasn't murdered. You were totally blindsided. Totally blindsided. Here again is Dennis Murphy. Christine Lovelace had been aproned up in her new shop baking pies all morning. It was a Wednesday in late August 2014, and she was getting stopped by with lunch. I just knew that he was going to be there, and I really kind of had a notion that he was going to bring me fried chicken that day. And um, lunch came and went. And no curtain. And no curtain. A few blocks away, Curtis had just stepped out of his law office. He was... As I was walking to my car, um, there was a... There was a gentleman in a, in a, in a suit um, waiting for me. It was Detective Gibson, and he was armed with an indictment from the grand jury. He was there to arrest Curtis for the murder of Corey Lovelace. And he said what? The only six. What would you think of that? That's, that's not the reaction that I was expecting at all. Then again, Curtis Lovelace never saw it coming. He told me to put my hands behind my back and uh, put me in handcuffs. What was going on? I didn't know. I remember hearing murder. I remember uh, hearing him. I was not aware that uh, that there was an investigation. Uh, you were totally blindsided. I was totally, totally blindsided. Blindsided because no one had really questioned Corey's death before. Even the police concluded she died of natural causes. Back at the pie shop, an in call. It was someone from a local TV station. He said, I'm holding a piece of paper in my hand. It's an indictment for the first degree murder of Corey Lovelace and I, I, I immediately said what? Cor Corey wasn't murdered. Life. Horrifying. I was placed in an interrogation room immediately. Curtis Lovelace, the former prosecutor, had a crucial choice to make. Either talk to the detective and try to clear this up right then and there or listen to his lawyerly training and keep quiet. Is right to remain silent. Thing you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. And you're a lawyer. And you know the number one rule is you do not talk to the police without having a lawyer present. I, but you talk. But, but I talk. I wanted to answer all their questions. I thought that they wanted to know the truth. Feel well. On that Valentine's morning, Curtis said Corey was still nursing that bad cold or flu. I walked back upstairs with her. She climbed into bed. He described leaving the house, then coming home, only to find his wife was cold and, and stiff. Uh, I just recall her, like her hands being up or something like that. And yet many other 
weird details surrounding his wife's death seem to elude Curtis. No, I don't remember anything that the two of you went to bed together. Yeah, I, I, I believe we did. Yeah, it was been a long time, so I, I, I mean, I guess it's possible that I would have left, you know, slept on a couch or something. You said you took the kids to school. I, I, again, I'm all. Ironically, didn't remember a whole lot about that day. Couldn't even remember whether he, in fact, took the kids to school that day. Right. I just would have thought that finding your wife dead in bed would have left more of an impression on you. To the detective, Curtis was trying to look helpful without really the chase. Did you smother Corey with a pillow? No, I did not. Did you and Corey have a bad argument, Kurt? Did it get out of hand? Did you snap and then put a pillow over her nose and mouth and suffocate her? No, no, I, I, there, there were no four. Um, it's, it's exactly what, what I've, what I've told Detective Baird in 2006, and what I told Detective Gibson in 2014, and what I'm telling you now. That, that is what happened. She was sick, and I came home, and I found her that morning, and she was. It was clear the detective's strategy hadn't yielded what he wanted. A confession. I have a problem with you not remembering all these things. The lawyer's goal of talking his way out of trouble hadn't exactly worked either. Even after he agreed, Curtis says, to take a lie detector test. In a short button-down shirt and leather loafers. For a very different courthouse look. Jailhouse black and white stripes. Coming up, are his kids the key to his freedom? They saw their mother alive that day. So therefore she couldn't have been dead upstairs. Right. Lovelace could not believe how his world had fallen apart. One minute he was Quincy's fair-haired boy, the next he's for killing his first wife, Corey. On my side of the bed when I found her dead. Meanwhile, Christine was in a panic for two reasons. Her husband had just been arrested, and now she was looking for her sons. I found out that all three boys were at the police station. The boys were? Cool. Um, and held in isolation earlier in the day. They were just 17, 15, and 12 years old at the time, all alone at the police headquarters. Once Christine found out they were there, she rushed to the station. What were the kids told? What did they think was going on? They actually thought this to the room, and they got up, and they all um, were very scared. And um, they hugged me, and I told them everything would be okay. We'll figure this out. Detective Gibson had rounded up the boys because he was looking into the, the death of your mom from 2006, okay? Mm -hmm. The detective started to question them about the last days of their mother's life. So you went into your mom's room and, yeah. she, and she was in bed? Yeah, we'd wake up every morning and then I'd go in her room and watch her. No. Larson, the youngest son, wasn't interviewed by police back in 2006 because he was only four years old. Now, he was telling Detective Gibson he wasn't sure if his mother was alive that morning. He said he only remembered getting out of bed and going to his mom's room. I remember, like, she in the room and then she wouldn't wake up. I think it was Valentine's Day. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's just, just, dad was gone, came back, and then I told him that, yeah, she was not waking up. But the two older boys said they did remember seeing Lincoln, the middle boy. I just remember, like, like waking up. Like, I remember her not feeling good, and I was sitting on the stairs. And then I went to school. I think I remember saying, I love you, before we left. But that's pretty much it. Don said he knew for certain that his mom was alive that February 14th. She was sitting on the steps, like, ready for us to leave the house. Christine was still trying to find her husband. She didn't know he'd been transferred to a different jail. Eventually, he called. And he told me and that we were going to have to, to fight some things. Christine was a wreck. Her husband was in jail, and she was dumbfounded as to why the police had taken the boys out of school and then interviewed them without parental permission. She felt better about this, though. The two oldest boys backed in their mom, Corey, alive Valentine's Day morning, just as Curtis said. 
they saw their mother alive that day. And that's that's the gist of their story. Yes, I saw her alive that morning yes. when Dad took us to school. Mm-hmm. So, there, Valentine's so therefore, Day. she couldn't have been dead upstairs and right. dying in rigor mortis setting right. in because we saw her alive. Dr. Lindsay had also told police two separate times her mom was alive that morning, had seen her off to school on Valentine's Day. Staying in front of Lake. On the day of her father's arrest, Lindsay was away at college when she had an emotional talk with... On the day he got arrested, and they passed the phone around, and they were sobbing because they were scared. Hold on. (laughs) And they asked me to come home, and that was the last thing I ever said to them, like, ever talked to them. That's within the Lovelace family. Around the time of Curtis's arrest, his relationship with his daughter once again deteriorated. The family doesn't want to get into details, but soon Lindsay found herself cut off from her brothers, too. I had been shut out, completely shut out. Well, you knew the charge against your father, and the fit he had put a pillow over your mother's nose and smothered her. That's a stark image to deal with. It's something I didn't ponder, and I chose not to ponder. Though a jury would soon be pondering Curtis's guilt or innocence. In August 2014, the 40th attorney found himself standing in a courtroom, this time as a defendant at his own arraignment. Having to appear in a courtroom that I had served as a prosecutor and dressed in, in stripes and, and having my my hands and my feet shackled, those those were some, some really low times. Married just eight months. Wife number three's commitment, for better or for worse, was immediately put to the test. My husband, who is kind and caring and compassionate, is charged with some that it makes no sense. If convicted, Curtis Lovelace could spend the rest of his life in prison for the murder of his wife, Corey. As if that weren't enough stress, his daughter, Lindsay, was about to drop a bombshell. Coming up. A daughter's. Know what's in Lindsay's head and in her heart. One day she was happy, and then everything changed. And a mother recounts what she says was Curtis's bizarre behavior the day her daughter died. I open the door and hands me Larson. And says, Oh, and by the way, Corey's dead. When. Curtis Lovelace was the hometown hero. Now his face was plastered on the front pages of Quincy's newspaper as an accused. The media, including our Quincy NBC affiliate, were all over the story, covering nearly every moment of his fall from grace. He's accused of killing his first wife. The former prosecutor would himself be prosecuted by Ed Parkinson. You can't get around rigor mortis in mice, and the timeline doesn't make sense with Curtis Lovelace. In January 2016, nearly a decade after Corey Lovelace's death, Curtis arrived for the first day of his trial. He faced 20 to 60 years in prison upon conviction for first-degree murder. He pleaded not out in the courtroom. It's clear to me it, it, it didn't matter what I did as far as the prosecution was concerned. Their only concern was that they needed to create a crime, and they needed for me to look bad in order to do that. Curtis didn't necessarily need prosecutors' help to elections. The day Corey died were at the very least unusual, including never calling 911. He called who? His boss. His wife is dead in the bed? Yes. And he calls his boss? Yeah, he said, my wife is dead. So his boss said, well, would you like me to call the ambulance people? Yes. Corey's mom, Marty Diedrichson, who lived just a few houses away, testified that Curtis broke the news of her daughter's death in what she thought was the most callous way. There was a knock at her door, and Curtis was standing there with four-year-old Larson. I open the door, and he hands me Larson. And says? Oh, and he leaves. Marty, I've got to say, I think that's very strange. Take your grandson, and by the way, your daughter's dead. He was emotionless, let's put it that way. Uh, People who saw him that day claimed that he was without emotion. Curtis also knew to revive his wife. On the day, why didn't you do CPR? I don't know. Um, I don't know why I didn't do CPR. I don't know why I, I, I didn't call 911. Um, in looking back, um, I uh, saw my wife, 
inventory, uh, know how to react. Prosecutor Parkinson next went after the first police investigation, pushing hard against Detective Baird, who handled the case. He questioned if Baird gave Curtis, who was then an assistant state's attorney, preferential treatment. He was a prosecutor, they were the police. He, how it happened, they bought into it. After all, he's one of us. So maybe tougher questions didn't get asked. I think so. Neighbors testify the Lovelace household was sometimes a stormy one. And that, Parkinson suggested to jurors, is the backdrop of Corey's death. They fought all the time. It's a arguments going both ways and it got out of control. Maybe the evidence indicates that placing a pillow over one's face to make them stop yelling at me, maybe in her weakened state, if she was, had flu-like symptoms. State's theory, remember, is the force of the pillow caused that cut and abrasion on the outside and inside of Corey's lip. The prosecutor then implied the pillow was placed under her arms after she died and later removed. If you leave it there through the night, and while rigor mortis is setting in, is thinking, oh my God, what did I do? And oh, there's that pillow, and her, I'm gonna get rid of that pillow, then the arms are already up. And you think that's what happened? Yes. But then came perhaps the most anticipated testimony for the prosecution. Lindsay, Curtis's own daughter, took a span of eight years. She told police her mother was alive that morning. She said she had felt better. But on the stand, with her dad's life on the line, she changed her story, telling jurors she was no longer sure her mom was alive that day. Don't remember any of it. But it doesn't stick in your memory. No. Nope. notes, you do tell him the story about seeing your mother. And then with a videotaped interview with uh, Detective Gibson, you seemed quite clear about that morning. And yes, you saw her and went off to school. What had happened in the interim between your statement and going into trial on the stand and then kind of stepping back from all of that? It was the fact of no one had honestly what had happened that day, and I'd never taken time to actually think about it. What well, Detective Gibson did a couple of years before when he took your statement, right? But it, again, I didn't know why he was asking me. I didn't know what was going on, and I gave the story I always gave. So when I had to sit there and think about it, I had to be honest with myself. And it, what I really do wish I could say, yes, I remember her, or no, I know I didn't see her. But you cannot say that. But I cannot say that. And this is not you getting back at your dad, who you're very sideways with at this point. No, because it hurts he my... He needs that story, and you're not going to give it to him. No, because it hurts my brothers, too, just for me not to honestly say, yes, I saw her. And remember, which is nothing. It's a black hole. It's a traumatizing event. And when kids go through traumatizing events, they block things out. And losing my mother was the worst day of my life. How are we to understand what's going on with, with Lindsay and Christine? Because she has told, she, yeah, she, like her brothers, remember seeing her mom alive. But then she backs away from it and says, I think, I can't remember really. I don't know what's in Lindsay's head and in her heart. One day she was happy and then everything changed. The prosecution still had to explain why the two oldest boys were adamant. Parkinson told jurors there was a two-day gap between Corey's death and the first police interviews with the kids. Ample time, he suggested, for the boys to be influenced by their dad. I think the children were confused as to which day. How about friends. coached? Do you think that he told them a story? He had custody of the discovery until Thursday afternoon. So from Tuesday till Thursday afternoon, I don't know what was said. Dr. Jane Turner, the pathologist Detective Gibson hired to review the case, took the stand and said science is where the truth lies. She concluded the most reasonable explanation for is that Corey was dead up to 12 hours before police arrived on the scene. I viewed this material and reviewed it with the eye of a scientist and, and what we know about the development of rigor mortis. What would a jury believe? Science? Guns? Corey's brother, a dentist, found himself struggling over the conflicting facts. Science is my living, you know. <laughs> I have to believe in that, but I also have to believe in the family at the same time, so I'm completely torn. I've never seen a more difficult case more closely argued. That doesn't seem to be middle ground. Parkinson urged the jury to focus on the science and one image. Corey in her bed, her body in rigor mortis. He said it proved she died hours before Curtis claimed. It proved he was lying. It proved, he argued, that Curtis killed her. Coming up, and Christine is feeling optimistic. I knew in my heart he was coming home. Until Christine came in and uh, 
They explained to her what was about to happen. had a simple message for jurors. Curtis should not be on trial. That's because there was no crime, and this was not a murder. It said the state's case was built on faulty science. I've stated repeatedly in the to prove that he murdered his wife. Veteran pathologist Dr. George Nichols created the Office of Medical Examiner for the state of Kentucky back in the 1970s. Now, as a defense expert, he told jurors rigor mortis is not an accurate indicator of time of death. And he added, for her life, there were no signs of struggle and only the cut and abrasion on her lip. You will fight until you no longer can. The thought that somehow you could suffocate someone with a pillow and there would be only one dental mark is ludicrous. Detective Bear Tassine, Corey's stomach area was still warm. How is that possible, the defense asked, if she had died up to 12 hours earlier. So if the body is warm to the touch, my common sense tells me, not science, that this is someone recently deceased. Absolutely. Is there an error in that assumption? No. Prosecution's contention that Curtis killed Corey after a heated argument. The couple's oldest son testified he didn't hear anything like that the night before. And he should know, because his room was right next to his parents. It was even connected by an extra door that was usually left slightly open. Jim and Jim and let me say The two older boys, unlike their sister, stuck to the story they told police. Did she ever get out of bed? Yes, I think she did. If jurors believed them, it blew apart the prosecution's timeline that Corey was murdered the night before. They said the same 2006 and Detective Gibson in 2014. And the defense had its sights on Detective Gibson. They claimed in 2013 he was an over-eager, newly promoted detective, primarily assigned to work crimes against seniors. This was his first murder case. He trained their service officer, and around the same time, he went to a one-week course on being a lead detective in a homicide case, and uh, he embarked on uh, this investigation that, that led to my indictment. Finally, the defense's medical one plausible explanation for Corey's death. She had a history of drinking and falling, and that caused that abrasion and cut. The bottom line, she was an alcoholic and bulimic suffering from a liver disease, someone who unfortunately died of natural causes. She's not a normal, has a significant disease of a major organ that is associated with sudden death and with liver failure. In the end, Curtis decided not to take the stand. Ten women and two men would decide Lovelace's fate. The deliberations went on for two full days. Christine got the call to come back to the courthouse. I knew in my heart he was coming home. That was it. You were going to prevail. He's coming home. Yes. But once she arrived, bailiffs led her to a small law library. Christine came in and uh, they explained to her for the first time what mistrial. Kurt was sitting across. He said, um, I'm not going to be able to come home tonight. And um, and um, I lost all my air. It was terrible. The jury was hopelessly deadlocked. The vote, six guilty, six not. Curtis would face another trial. Since he couldn't make bail, he'd remain in jail, unless... They, they had offered uh, a, a second-degree um, murder plea, but I knew it was a decision not only that I had to make, but we had to make as a family. And I didn't know um, whether I could put them through another year of what we had already gone through. That's when one of Curtis's lawyers turned to Christine. And he said that this can all end right now if Kurt agrees to take this deal. He said it would keep him from dying in prison. But he'd have to admit his that's the condition, right? Correct. And that he wouldn't have to spend probably any more than 13 years in prison. The two said no thanks to the state's offer and geared up for a second trial. But that forced them to face another dire reality. They were totally broke unable to afford another thing to do 
I mean, at that point, it, there didn't appear to be any option. This could be a moment for Christine to say, I'm out of here. I didn't sign on to be some Tammy Wynette for this guy standing by her man. I'm gone. Yeah, and, and, and who, who, could, who could blame her? Uh, um, but that's not, not who she is. It looked as though Curtis would have to use a public defender. But Christine wouldn't accept that option. She worked her connections and eventually ended up here in Chicago. She came to our office and uh, told us her story, and uh, I remember exploring further. John Lovey is not a criminal lawyer. He's a civil rights attorney by practice who also does pro bono work with the Exoneration Project. Its aim, overturn wrongful convictions. But Curtis hadn't been convicted, at least not yet. Still, Lovey and co take the case. Their services would be free. The main concern that I had in this case from the outset was really the lack of evidence. This didn't feel like a murder case from the beginning. With a new defense team in place, Christine got working on her next goal, making bail to get her eventually put up the cash. Curtis Lovelace was a local celebrity, or at least so infamous, according to his new defense team, that he couldn't get a fair trial in Reed. So trial number two was moved from Quincy to Springfield, Illinois. All right. About two hours away. The defense is going to come up here and try to portray uh, as a pillar of the That's a facade. David were the prosecution. This time cameras were allowed in the courtroom when the trial started in March 2017. Our houses were 15 feet apart from each other, so... As in the first trial, Neighbors testified they often heard arguing from the Lovelace home. This woman lived next door and says she heard... Sh Essentially, for the entire time that we lived there. So, six years. As I walked by the house, I, I heard an argument, a loud argument. Another neighbor testified she heard Corey and Curtis really going at it, and on a specific date, day 2006. She happened to be out for a stroll. It actually I did cause me to pause. I guess I was listening to see if somebody was in distress. The prosecution's theory this go-round on how Corey died remained the same. After a heated argument the night before Valentine's wife with a pillow in a fit of rage, he then waited up to 12 hours before police were called. Come over here and have a seat, please. And once again, science would play a leading role in the prosecution's case. But prosecutors had a new witness, a star forensic expert. I have also testified before that. In a 64-year career, Dr. Werner Spitz has consulted on the JFK and Martin Luther King assassinations, as well as in other high-profile cases, including those of Phil Spector and Casey Anthony. Appearance of the injury leaves no doubt that this is. In a darkened courtroom, Spitz showed photos and talked about that cut inside Corey's mouth. Curtis had told police his wife had fallen in the days before she died, his explanation for that injury. But this expert said he saw no signs the cut was an old one. There is no evidence of looks like at the time that it was, was incurred. The abrasion on the outside of the lip and the cut inside indicated to Spitz that an object, like a pillow, had been placed on Corey's face shortly before she died. This is not an accident. This is not a, uh, a suicide. This is a homicide. Then came testimony the first jury never got to hear, and it was explosive. For this trial, the judge allowed Erica Gomez, wife number two, to testify. Remember, when we interviewed her, she wanted on the witness stand, she could no longer be shielded by a disguise. He violently attacked me. Prosecutors called the ex-wife to the stand to try to show that Curtis had a history of violence. She recounted one incident, she says, that happened at home during their marriage. He had started probably drinking around, nothing about kids, and he came rushing at me and tried to grab me and tried to hurt me and grabbed my shirt and he yanked it up really hard, hard enough to injure my knee. He ripped my shirt and grabbed me again, and I kept on trying to fight him off. Then Erica told the jury another shocking story. She said Curtis had been drinking at a party, and 
Later that night, he blurted out something she found disturbing. He's rarely honest except for when he's been drinking and it's something. And I asked him what he was upset about and he stated something about she was writhing underneath me and then he said, oh, the black cat. As strange as that story sounded, the prosecutor took it to mean this. Curtis wasn't tossed last minutes of life as she struggled while Curtis smothered her. Erica had a story to tell. There's one particular quote that came out, and he says, I could hear her writhing beneath me. Yes, that was evidence. She and gave it sounds as though he's talking about killing his wife at that moment. That's what we thought it sounded like, and she testified to that on her writhing beneath me. And that's pretty much what would have happened if suffocation was occurring. The prosecution believed its evidence against Curtis was overwhelming. Not so fast, said the defense. That's because it had some things up its sleeve evidence. And what an interesting nugget they had found. Coming up, tough questions for Erica. Someone made that up. Someone put those words in there. My signature should be there. Anybody can redo this. And bombshell testimony. Did you know when you did this investigation that the had been moved? I did not. Uh, we told the judge we were his life in the hands of John Lovey. His new attorney, who took on the defense for free, had more than 20 years of experience, just not in criminal law. Was this your first murder trial? Was. I did a battery criminal defense case right out of law school, but other than that, this is basically my first criminal defense case. On the other hand, since he was broke, he didn't have a lot of options. Before he died, a massive In his opening remarks, Lovey said the state hadn't presented any evidence of murder for a reason. There was no murder. All the medical evidence in this case is that she sudden onset condition brought on by her alcohol. One of the defense's key goals was to debunk the damaging testimony of Curtis's ex, Erica, that he had violently attacked her and ripped her shirt. Once we'd finished talking, and uh, I had taken my notes. And one of the first defense witnesses was Major Larry. I asked her if she wanted to make a sworn statement, a formal sworn statement, which is in writing. She said yes, she would. Erica had filed a domestic violence charge with the guard, since Curtis at the time was still active. The Major was appointed to look into the charges. He testified as to what Erica told him. She started backing up. Then he went down to pick her up, and when he did, she said that he accidentally struck her in the chin as he was reaching for her shoulder. I'm going to slow you down here. You said accidentally. Where did you get the word accidentally? That was her words. Erica at first reported Curtis accidentally hit her. The Major added she initially didn't mention anything about Curtis ripping her shirt. He concluded her charges were unfounded. There was nothing there to actually lead to a domestic violence fight. Armed with that information, the defense confronted Erica in cross-examination with her own statement. But Erica said the document used in court was a fake. Someone made that up. Someone put those words in there. My signature, this is typed, this isn't written. Anybody can redo this. Then the defense did something unusual. It asked Erica about other accusations she's made against Curtis. And she had a laundry list of complaints. He knows how to forge paperwork. He used my social security number to try how to get rid of evidence. He stole my daughter's bicycle out of the garage. At one point, an overwhelmed Erica asked for a timeout. <laughs> Can I get away, please? But Erica wasn't folding. She blurted out another allegation in court against her ex. He was poisoning me. My hair was falling out. There were white lines on my fingers. I was extremely sick. Erica claimed Curtis had tried to poison her and her daughter. She told police he likely put something in their orange juice. But according to the defense, there was a problem with that charge. Erica had never sought... That you never went to a doctor and said, I think I need poison. It wouldn't have mattered. When Erica left the stand, what do you think the jury made of her? I think they were shocked that the state called her. You know, the state thought that they could score a point, but... When she was subjected to cross-examination, she wasn't a credible person. There was one into this jury, and it concerned the lead detective. Adam Gibson, he argued, had gone pathologist shopping. That is, he consulted a series of pathologists before finding one to give him the answer he was looking for. That, yes, Corey's death was, in fact, a murder. 
if my opinion is not what somebody else. Dr. Shaku Tease was one of the pathologists Gibson approached. Her opinion, Detective Gibson, wanted her to call this a homicide when that was not her conclusion. He had a theory and he was looking somehow to substantiate that theory. The original pathologist, the original coroner, said that there, he got other opinions from other pathologists who also told him, there's nothing unusual here, you're barking up the wrong tree. Then came even more damaging accusations against Detective Gibson. The defense said it obtained, at the last minute, important emails and other documents it was supposed to have received from the police, but never did or evidence. You understand? It was not something that I thought of, no. One email was from a medical expert. He warned Detective Gibson that if the first pathologist left the cause of death as undetermined, that opinion would trump anyone else's. And he implied that would give plenty of reason. Yeah, should have been turned over. I, I believe so, it should, yes. You didn't turn it over? I did not. The prosecution's case appeared to be teetering. Then came another blow. William Ballard was one of the first EMTs on the scene. When he had stickers on Corey's body to check for a heartbeat, so he moved her arms. Her arms were down against her chest. I had to pull them up to uh, check for a pulse, check for uh, any rigor mortis, and to also move her arms up to where I could place my stickers where I'm supposed to. Arms before the police photos were taken. That means her arms were not in the same position as seen in the photographs, the ones that started this entire second investigation. The defense seized on that fact. Did you know when you decided to uh, pursue this investigation that the arms... I did not. Is this the first time you're hearing that? Did you hear that? That the arms have been moved prior to the pictures? Yes. Because basically your investigation took off because you believe that the arms were in a position of suspicious, right? They're, yes. Did you all just come up we swore? A final surprise. Miss Lovelace took the stand. He insisted he wasn't a violent man never harmed his second wife, Erica, and certainly did not kill Corey. I did love Corey, and uh, and I know the kids loved her, and, and uh, it's been difficult. The defense wrapped up its questioning with an enormous toll the two trials had taken on him and his family. How long have you and your family had lived with this trial? Since 6 to 6. But this go round, the jury was out about 2 hours before it came back with a decision. We the jury find the defendant Curtis T. Lovelace not guilty. 11 years after Corey's death, two and a half years after Curtis's arrest, not guilty. Two hour verdict, murder trial. I mean, what does that tell you? That tells me that, uh, that they were absolutely convinced Kurt was innocent. That's not how prosecutor Ed Parkinson sees it. So does the system work or has a guy gotten away with murder? Sometimes it works. You said you're looking at a guy who you think might have got away with murder. I feel bad because I think we were right. How do you feel right now? While the legal consequences for Curtis are over, the fallout from Corey's death continues to paralyze the extended family. I don't know what to believe anymore. Means estranged from her father. But she hopes to salvage something despite all that's happened, a relationship with her brothers. I just pray every day and hope that one day I'll get a call, a text, a message, an email, something from one of them. Corey's mom, Marty, did you come to an opinion, if any, he had in, in, in Corey's death? Curtis? Those are tucked here. I have kept my mouth shut for a long time, and I'm going to keep it that way. Curtis says the state offered increasingly attractive plea deals before the start of the second trial, but he turned them all down. He against the police and the city of Quincy. The suit alleges malicious prosecution and argues Curtis's kids were falsely imprisoned during those police interviews. 
representatives for the police in Quincy said they had no comment. The family has moved out of Quincy, and Curtis has been Illinois. A couple of requests that we go ahead. And, get and both he and Christine are starting separate exoneration-type organizations. They say they want to help others wrongfully accused or convicted. Christine, what happened to you guys in this whole thing, do you think? I don't know what happened to us, Dennis. We're still figuring that as our country every day. And now I think we have an obligation to share this story and to help other people. Your goal was to, to leave that courthouse an innocent man. Yes, I believe um, looking in the eyes of that jury, um, seeing you know the tears from some of them, how quickly that declaring to, to me and, and, and the world that, that, that I'm innocent. Curtis Lovelace. A life interrupted. That's all for this edition of Dateline. We'll see you again next Friday at 9, 8 Central, and of D-Nightly News. I'm Lester Holt for all of us at NBC News. Good night.